David's victory over Goliath. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 50. Brethren, taking the full text of chapter 17, what we have before us today regarding David is his fight with Goliath and his victory over him as a picture, a picture which shows David to us as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, an example and an edification for the body of Christ around the world. That which is a type of the head always bears a relationship to its members. And as the members of Christ's mystical body that we now are and shall yet more fully be likened to himself, it's but one thought that after all, after all of this today, we, I pray by God's grace, will see these connections and will do so for our good and for his glory. Most importantly, for his glory. Now, first, let's deal with the fact that David was a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples, early church fathers, martyrs, and faithful teachers of God's word throughout history have agreed that David typed or pictured as an example for us the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's so vital for us to see and understand about David's life is this. Before he ever fought Goliath, he was anointed of God. Let me say that again. Before he ever fought Goliath, he was anointed of God. Now we know the prophet Samuel went down to Bethlehem and poured oil upon David's head as David was chosen by God out from among the people. While King Saul had been anointed with a small vial of oil, I believe that's to show his brief reign and temporary renown. That is contrasted versus the full horn of oil poured out upon David. This pictures for us a more excellent and powerful reign. And so, in a spiritual application, this pictures for us the law. It pictures old Judaism, which King Saul himself pictures, having a limited measure of blessings, while the gospel, which David represents, is characterized by its fullness. By its fullness. Remember, our Lord Jesus was anointed, anointed with the oil of gladness above all others. Remember that grace and truth came by him. Unlike the measure of the reign of King Saul, David, or all kings for that matter, Jesus' reign is from everlasting to everlasting. And what's more, the Spirit was not given by measure to Jesus, but in fullness, in fullness, in fullness. David was anointed several times in 1 Samuel chapter 2 by his brethren, in chapter 3 by all the elders of Israel, while our Lord Jesus was anointed by God the Father, anointed by the saints, anointed of the church, and we know by the Spirit who took him forth to fight great battles for his people, especially the battle on the cross. At his baptism, coming up out of the Jordan River, we know that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit as it rested upon him, descending, as John the Baptist tells us, like a dove out of heaven. Immediately Jesus was driven into the wilderness for a 40-day conflict with Satan, the adversary of our souls. His battles were in spirit and power, power of the highest, because the might and majesty of the Holy Spirit of God rested upon him. And so, our Lord Jesus was sent by the Father to his brethren 
as David was sent by his earthly father to his earthly brethren with gifts. Gifts and graces. Gifts and graces and comfortable words. As our Lord Jesus came saying, Peace be with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus remained concealed for a while, having come from glory, from his Father's bosom. But finally Jesus came forward and was recognized as the one sent by God. He came bearing gifts. He came on a mission of love from God the Father. He came to those whom he was not ashamed to call brethren. Likewise, we read how David was treated. And what a familiar picture it is when we learn that his brethren didn't receive him very lovingly. Oh no, they answered his announcement with spite and rudeness. And they laid bitter accusations to his charge. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Just think of how Joseph's brothers, another type of Christ, how they treated Joseph when they said, you think we're going to kneel and bow before you? Think again. And so the Bible tells us of Jesus. Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. Even though he came to them with tender words of love and mercy, even though he came with his blessings, they replied to him just like Joseph's brothers replied to him and here David's brothers replied to him with words of scorn. For the bread of heaven, they gave him stones. For the joyful news from heaven, they gave him benedictions of hell. For his cure, they gave him cursing. Never was a brother, the one whom the Bible calls the firstborn among many brethren, so despised or so rejected. The parable of the wicked husbandman was fulfilled towards Jesus. We also know that the vine dresser in that parable said, this is my son. They will receive him. But on the contrary, because of their wicked hearts, they said, this is the heir. Let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Brethren, listen, Jesus was despised despised by his brethren, the very brethren he came to bless. And David, as you know, answered his own brother's rudeness with gentle words. He did not return railing for railing, no. He came with tender care while he endured their scorn. And so in this David gives to us an example, a picture, a type, as it were, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who the Bible says when he was reviled, reviled not again. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Consider then our Lord as he endured the wicked contradictions from sinners against his holy character, what was his reply? What was his only reply? Maybe you recall on that dark, dark day on Calvary. It was this. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And yet for all that he endured, not a word of anger dropped from his lips. And so here we see in David. As an example. We have in Christ. How David was also rejected. By his own brethren. 
And this picture is really our first comparison. How David was an example being a type of Christ for us to picture this morning. What was it? What was it that moved David? You know what it was? It was the very thing that should be the case for us that moves us as well. It was love. Love for his brethren. Love for his people. Love for his family. Love for his neighbors. And what does the Bible teach us about love? Does it teach us it's some warm goobly gook, some little cute tingle in our toes, some feeling? No. To be quite blunt with you this morning, I am sick and tired of hearing this world's definition of love. Love is not where two vile sinners, two men lie down one with another and call it gay. Love is not two people, a man and a woman living together before they're married honorably. No, that's not love. Love is not just some word or feeling or descriptive term about how much you love that new Harley Davidson motorcycle that you paid with with money you didn't have for something you didn't need. That's not love. Love is not being on good terms with someone else in a relationship because they agree with you on everything. That's not love. Love, the Bible says, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Love being that one object of our affection should be Christ himself, because the Bible says God is love. And that love, godly love, is what moved David. He saw his people defied by the Philistines. He saw his God defied by the Philistine Goliath. He saw how his people were crushed in spirit by their enemies and in his soul a righteous indignation was stirred up. When we heard the terms of the wicked enemy's defiance, we learned that David understood God was blasphemed and brought into the indictment against all Israel. David wouldn't stand for it. In his anointed heart, he could not stand for it because the name of Jehovah was mocked by the braggart Goliath, that gruesome giant who put fear in the heart of the Israelite army who fled before him. As the Philistines laughed and mocked and celebrated. It's no wonder. The devoted heart of David. This young shepherd boy. Who loved God. And loved his people was moved with the passion of a warrior. At the very sound of this uncircumcised Philistine who dared to blaspheme the honor of God, the God of heaven and earth. David's patriotic ambition and resolute duty to put his people before himself also stirred in his gut. And so how could he turn back? No, he was moved to the ready, he was moved to vanquish the enemy who would dare be married to the king's daughter. David was determined by his anointing and through his faith in God not to draw back, not to accept defeat, to reject cowardice. No, he was ready to do battle, battle with the giant. Goliath. And so David 
David is here a picture for us, really foreshadowing, if you will, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. How so? Because he loved his own. He loved his own. David was ready to lay down his life. And Jesus was ready to lay down his life for his sheep because of the great shepherd that he is. Jesus, our greatest example, said, Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And as the prophet foretold about Jesus, the zeal of thine house, that is the father's, hath eaten me up. He was consumed with an absolute focus on completing the task for the Father and for those the Father gave him from the foundation of the world. You see, in Jesus, there was joy set before him that he should have the church, the body of Christ, as his bride. In his victory, his ultimate battle on the cross, she, his bride, would be lifted up to his royal position and share in his crown and glory. The new Jerusalem, which we are reminded is the mother of us all. And to be and to our Lord Jesus the gift of the Father as his reward. And this inspired him so that he went onward undeterred to the battle. Why? For your sakes and for mine. And so I say, let us pause and give him praise and bless his name. Forever. Brethren, we ought to have the most grateful hearts blessing his name. The name that is above every name. The one who gave himself for us. Brethren, as part of his church being his bride, we are partakers in all that he did. It was for us that he fought for us that he won the victory for us that he is seated at the right hand of the father interceding on our behalf while we can see the type in David we must never ever forget to adore Jesus where he is mirrored in a sense before us in these passages today He gave us hope where there were no hope to be found. Bless his holy name. And while we can see this type in David, I want you to learn a deeper, deeper insight about these passages. Understand that Goliath is called in the Masoretic Hebrew tongue, not the English word translated champion, but the middleman, or in other words, the mediator. One who stands in the gap between two forces. Now, you can see the application at work in the text. There is the host of the Philistines on one side, Israel on the other side. A valley in between them. And so Goliath says, I will represent the Philistia. I stand as the mediator. Instead of all the rank and file Philistine armies coming to the fight, he said, I will fight as the representative of my nation. So Goliath, in his terms, were simple. Instead of the individuals in both armies fighting, they should have mediators representing each army and those mediators would determine and settle the conflict. Now, brethren, that's exactly...
the type of ground upon which our Lord Jesus fought the battle for us. Glory to his name. As sinners, what did we do? We fell. We fell in Adam. We fell in Adam and our salvation now is by another representative, the second Adam, who is Christ. Jesus is that one mediator between God and man in his love for us and in his zeal for God. We see him stepping forward into the midst of the two camps of good versus evil, God versus Satan, facing the defiant adversary, contending on our behalf to decide the outcome which could never, ever have been decided by us. Our warrior king of kings goes forward to the fight. And brethren, let us never forget that in view of the cross, in view of the glory, in view of the battlefield, in view of its shame, just remember, the Bible gives us a testimony about him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, glory to his name. David, the son of Jesse, when offered the armor of King Saul, rejected all carnal weapons, rejecting all contributions from man, so that God alone would be glorified in the defeat of the enemy. What was impossible for man was possible for God, who anointed him and equipped him for victory. Now, we know they still tried to put Saul's helmet and armor on David. They tried to have him use King Saul's sword. But he said to them, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And in like manner, Jesus, the Son of God, renounced all earthly armor. We know they would have taken our Lord by force if they could to make him an earthly king. But what did he say? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Swords would have surely leaped from their scabbards at his bidding, as there were many zealots who would have gladly followed such a command, making Peter's cutting off of Malchus's ear look like child's play. But Jesus commanded, put up your swords into their sheaths, for those that live by the sword shall die by the sword. One of the temptations of the desert was not only that he should have the kingdoms of the world, but that he should have taken them by the use of such means as Satan in his depravity, would have suggested he desired for Jesus to bow down before him just as Goliath desired David to bow down before him. But Jesus and David, as a picture of Jesus' faith in his father, wouldn't have it. And to this day, the great battle of Jesus Christ against the powers of darkness is not with carnal weapons of men, but with the smooth stones of the brook you see, brethren, listen, the preaching of the gospel is what slays the giant and will lay him low to the last day, even before he's cast into the lake of fire on the day of God's judgment. And it's vanity, vanity to think that victory shall be found in wealth, in carnal warfare, or as some think in these days, a presidential election outcome. No, no. No, no president or potentate can do this for us, but Jesus can. And we will never put our faith in anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ, under whom all governments will bow. We must look to the power of God Almighty as we are admonished, not by might, nor by power, 
but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Never forget. Never pull back. Never surrender the preaching of the cross, which is to the world foolishness, yes, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so, listen, we can see our champion, our mediatorial king going forward to the fray with weapons of his own choosing and those that humanity despises. With holy strength and power he went. And so David here pictures this power when he does something. He speaks, he opens up his mouth, he gives a word and he says something to Goliath. Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I cometh to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. While Goliath scoffed, <laughs> the Philistine army scoffed, <laughs> and even the Israelites scoffed. <laughs> David brought God's message with God's anointing. The gospel is God's message with God's anointed, empowered by God's Holy Spirit. And this is what's been lacking in our so-called modern-day evangelicalism in America. I must remind you, that the Lord has sent his gospel. The Lord has promised to bless it. And because of that promise, we can rest assured that it will accomplish the very ends for which it was ordained. David's words, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, must be our motto, brethren. Jesus came in that name. He came in that name for us. Came in that name to bear the very wrath of God Almighty and to vanquish even death and hell. So David smote Goliath, we know, not in his loins, not in his hand, not in his feet, not in his chest, but in a vital point on what Charles Haddon Spurgeon aptly preached the brow of his presumption on the forehead of his pride. So I can see Goliath lifting up his visor to take a look at what he viewed as this little contemptible man, this little contemptible enemy, right when the stone sunk in deep, deflating forever that wicked, boastful soul. And so I say that because when Jesus ran into the fray to co contend with sin, he projected his atoning sacrifice as a stone that has smitten sin and all its powers upon the forehead. Remember, Jesus is that stone which the builders rejected, but by him, all of the builders of sinful man, like those who were building the Tower of Babel, as it were, with the emblem of sin around their necks, is slain. Not merely wounded, not merely injured, but slain. Slain by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brethren, remember this also. David cut off Goliath's head with his own sword. Now, think about that for a minute. Augustine's commentary brings out the thought that the triumph of our Savior is set for in the history of David. He, through death, he said, destroyed him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So he, dying, slew death. Used the same sword of the enemy. Cut off the enemy's head. What's the picture? The cross. The cross 
The very thing that was meant to be the death of Jesus was the death of sin. And so we can see in our Savior's hand the gory head of the giant, sin. Look at it, all of you who were once under its tyranny. Look at the horrible spectacle of the enemy. Our Lord has slain our enemy. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When David had achieved the death of Goliath, he was met by the maidens of Israel who came out singing with joyful music, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his tens thousands. So he had his triumph. Meanwhile, the host of Israel, seeing the Philistine giant was dead, took heart and dashed upon the enemy's army. The Philistines were terrified and fled. And every Israelite that day became a victor through the victory of David. They were more than conquerors through him that loved them and won the victory for them. And in a greater way, in an eternal way, we are victors through Christ. Jesus is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And in him, if you are redeemed by his blood, regardless of your age, your social status, your background, your sex, your nationality, your financial situation, your health, and regardless of your sin, you are walking in victory. You are triumphant. You are more than a conqueror through him. Though we should have been defeated in our weaknesses, in our sin, Jesus, in his mercy and grace, brought us into his own chariot. And we chase the enemies now. We trample them under our feet for Whosoever the Bible says is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Glory to his name. And secondly, I want you to know that David is an example for every believer in Christ. All of us. If we're ever to do anything for God or the body of Christ, we too must be anointed with the holy oil, that is the Holy Spirit himself. It's vanity to think that we could do anything without his anointing upon our hearts and minds. Unless the Holy Spirit anoints us, we can have no strength and have no means to fight against the wickedness of this generation. You don't receive his anointing because someone tells you you do. You don't. Yeah, you might say, but my pastor said, come on down the aisle here and you'll receive the Holy Spirit's anointing. And so I walked down an aisle. I followed what the man said and repeated after him, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, come into my heart, come into my heart. And I was declared a member of the body of Christ with all power and anointing. After I even opened my eyes up and I started speaking in tongues. Hum, pa, ba, la, ba, la, ba, la, ba, la, ba. No. No, brethren, listen. The anointing of God by the Holy Spirit, like the kingdom, as Jesus said, cometh not with observation. Jesus went on to testify, the wind bloweth where it listeth and Thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it comes or whether it goes. So it is with every one that is born of the Spirit. You might say to me, Brother Casey, then what? What should I do? Listen to me. Wait. Wait. Wait upon him. Wait upon the Lord. There cannot come out from you what has not been put in you. Do you hear me? Wait. You must wait. And then when you receive, you must give what he gives to you. Give it to the thirsty. 
Give it to the starving souls, just as Jesus describes. He said, the water that I shall give you shall be in you a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And so, brethren, listen to me. You can't do David's work if you don't have David's anointing. So when you remember Jesus himself also waited, you'll understand about the heavenly anointing. And you must do the same. And you must do so by faith. Jesus uh, did not even go into his public ministry until the Spirit of God rested upon him. The apostles also, what did they do? They waited. They waited at Jerusalem and they did not go out to preach the gospel until power was given unto them from on high. That power from the anointing of the Holy Spirit does not come from carnal means. It does not come, listen carefully, it does not come because you graduated from Bible college or hold multiple doctorate degrees from seminary. And yet, that's exactly how this generation looks at the value of a man who mounts the pulpit. They gleefully consider such a man as dynamic and make those types of prerequisites as part of their so-called pulpit committee process, while uncalled, unqualified, and even unanointed people are part of said committees. They have no business in determining the qualifications of God's anointed. You don't receive the anointing because of experience any more than you become an automobile for standing in your garage for a certain period of time, even if it's 50 years, 80 years, 100 years, etc., you don't receive this anointing through your wealth. And if you ever think you can, then my message to you today is the same as Peter's to Simon the sorcerer. Thy money perish with thee. I'm sick and tired of seeing a church identify a young man who they think should be a preacher. Maybe because he's intelligent. Maybe because he comes from a nice family. Maybe he's actively involved in leading in ways through their so-called youth ministry and has taken what looks to be a liking to public speaking. Maybe he's like the, I don't know, local quarterback in high school, and just, at least in their minds, a natural leader. So what do they do? They take up a collection. They send him off to seminary, where he makes good grades, stays out of trouble, and then graduates with a degree affirmed upon him by his professors. And in agreement with his particular denomination's bylaws, etc., you're getting the picture, he's endorsed to preach the gospel. And so he's marketed to any church currently associated with their synod, their convention, their pact, etc., and whammo! He's hired by a church because all of the boxes in their carnal minds, at least, were checked off. The problem often is that this approach only produces wells without water and clouds without rain. Oftentimes, as is the case for our generation of professing professional clergy, there just simply is no power. Why? Because there's no anointing. What's the answer? What's the answer, brethren, to this foolish approach to ministry in our generation? The answer is this. Again, wait. Wait upon the Lord. You say, but how? Get on your knees. Get to the cross. Bow before the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ who says without me, you can do nothing. Be still. Wait in faith and in hope. Wait until he gives you the anointing which comes with power. The only power that qualifies you to do his work, his way, and to his praise. I want you to consider how David for us is an example of how opportunity actually comes. You see, David fell into his role providentially. Little did he know that when he went with a load of cheese, bread, and wine to his brothers, that he'd be loaded with the power of God in the company of his brethren and in the face of the enemies of God the very next minute. Rather than look for some specific work, what did he do? He was prepared, and we should be prepared for any work that God has carved out for our lives. 
So be ready. Be ready. Have your tools sharpened and know how to handle them. When we feel the call of God to do something for him, anything for him, we don't need to wait on anyone else. You young men that say you're called into ministry, you better get this. You better get this right now. We do not need to wait on anyone's approval, even those we hold with the highest respect and admiration. Now, why do I say this? I say this because David didn't say, well, you know, I really should wait until my oldest brother, Eliab, and while I'm thinking about it, Abinadab, and oh yeah, and then there's Shammah are okay with it. Until at least I have their endorsement for going up against Goliath. If he'd have done that, we'd not have had the testimony of his overcoming Goliath at all. We should honor our elder brethren in ministry and in the church, yes, always, but never before the moving of the Holy Spirit of God, as if there was a choice. No, follow him. Follow him. Truth is, I'd rather die. I'd rather die than preach from a pulpit that required men's approval or consent as to what I preach. My calling is to deliver to you, whoever has ears to hear this, deliver to you what he has delivered to me. David was of that mind, and brethren, so was, must we be. If we're to have any semblance of loyalty to the only one from which true power comes, David served him. He served the living God. And he went about his business without being distracted or drawing back from the fear of man or yielding to what might be termed today as political correct speech. Never. Never. We can also learn from David a way in which we can return at times quiet answers to those who, out of jealousy, pride, or fear, attempt to dismiss our work for God. I do think, however, that much of the time it's better to give no answer at all. You see, David, as an example for us, spoke better by his deeds than by his words. Came back from fighting Goliath, he held the enemy's head in his hand. I can just see Eliab's look on his face and Abinadab and Shammah running out to see. I can see how David, uh, he's just holding up Goliath's gruesome head. And in him holding up his head would say it all. It wouldn't be due to pride in David himself, but in God, in God's work done God's way. We can also learn from David's use of weapons that he was familiar with certain things, weapons that he actually had tried. Now, I've heard many scoff at the idea that David killed such a man, such a giant, with just a stone. But everyone, I'm telling you, everyone who's ever suggested that to me totally, totally misses the point. The great part of the population in Israel had been already disarmed by the Philistines. And you'll discover that in chapter 13. So David had no sword. David had no experience handling a sword. Yet he had a whole lot of practice with his sling and could like some of you sharpshooters out there, some of you Snipers out there, he could group stones within a hair's length at Lord knows what distance. David, as he should, felt most equipped in his own shepherd's clothing with shepherd's tools. And threw the stones out of the brook. He didn't randomly grab a handful. No, he carefully chose them. He chose the stones that would fit perfectly in his sling. The kind of stones that would do the most damage. Now, it wasn't the sling or the stones he trusted in, as we're told, he trusted in 
the God of the slain and of the stone. David went to work with his sling as if he felt the responsibility to be his own. To miss the mark would prove his own weakness and so the measure of his aim and effectiveness of the blow from the stone to Goliath's head was to be of God's handling. This should be understood by all of us because we're to do good works for Christ as if by those good works we're saved, which we know we're not, but as if, as if we were while trusting solely in the merits of Jesus, as though we did nothing at all. No buildings named after us. No. No statues or paintings of ourselves adorning the church. Never. No. If there are any such things, brethren, tear them down and repent. Because in so doing, you're robbing God of glory that only belongs to him. Even in his old age, David gave his best for God. Like David, we must never be satisfied with mediocrity, which as the late Dr. R.G. Lee preached, is a menace to the ministry. We must trust in the word of God, every word as our own smooth stones with perfect fit in our slings, our lives. To continue to stay on the offense of every day. We do that by preaching Christ and Him crucified. We do that by commanding all men everywhere to repent. We do that by confessing our sins to God and to each other while we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And finally, in looking at David as an example for our lives, brethren, notice the work that David had begun. With his faith cast solely on the Lord, he did not cease until he saw it through to the end. He slew Goliath, yes, but he was not satisfied until he cut off his head. If only our work for Christ would be as David's. Have you shared the gospel with a child? Maybe your own. Then don't stop. Don't yield. Don't stop. Continue until you see that child walking along in the sheepfold with the other sheep. Showing up on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, etc. That's not proof at all. It's easy for a dead twig to show movement as it floats down the river. So no, movement is not proof of salvation. I think that's the problem today in modern American evangelicalism with so many pseudo-psychological appeals for decisions versus spirit power. Spirit power, holy spirit power that comes when commanding repentance and righteousness, evidence and sanctification with accountability to follow. I can still remember the first time I challenged a fellow pastor back in 1998. This guy was all about numbers, all about numbers, easy believism. But the more I studied his life, and let me tell you, you better make note, we're always being studied. We're always being studied. As the Apostle Paul said, we're like living epistles to be read of men daily. And so the fruit of the Spirit just wasn't there. It boiled down to me asking him, tell me. What's so different about you from the day you say you were saved to this day? To this day, there was silence. Uncomfortable silence. Until finally, he acknowledged his need to be born again. Not of the will not of flesh, but praise God 
of the Spirit. And that was King Saul's problem, incidentally. Because unlike this man who actually acknowledged his carnal, religiously lost state, Saul took his self-reliance to the grave. Don't be like Saul. My question to you today is, is the Bible on your side? For all of your claims, is the Bible on your side? Is Jesus, most importantly, is Jesus on your side? Those are questions that must be asked and must be answered. For some of you, you might be associated with a small group, poor people, maybe even considered an outsider. So what? If God be for you, who can be against you? If you have no strength to overcome the enemies of the gospel, but you have that which is promised by God himself, then listen to me. You have enough. You have enough. What's impossible for man is possible with God. And you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. I never know who might listen to a message like this. I never know. And so I don't know who's on the Lord's side. But I pray that you are. If you're not, do you feel the heavy burden of sin on your soul? Do you feel that heavy burden? Do you know? Do you acknowledge? Do you see it? Have the scriptures testified against you? Let me give you some hope, I pray, today. Jesus never rejects those who come to him by faith. And his blood is able to cleanse you from all sin. He is the great slayer of sin. Just as David cut off the head of Goliath, Jesus crushed the head of the serpent Satan on Calvary's cross. He is the champion. He is the victor of the Goliath of sin. And he sits on Zion's hill holding the head of the enemy because Jesus is victorious. He is victorious for all who will bow before him in faith, trusting in him as he is Lord and Savior. What do I do, you might ask? What do I do? Jesus responds, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and the Lord will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon my plea to you today is to run to Jesus by faith. Repent of your sin, trusting in him and what he has done for those the Father had given to him before the world began. Those he said would hear his voice, trust him, confess your sins, confess him for as he is the Lord and Savior of sinners. And when you do, you'll go from being buried under the weight of sin and fleeing from Goliath, Goliath of sin, to being seated with Jesus in his own chariot crushing the enemy under your feet, being more than a conqueror, no longer the conquered, but more than a conqueror through him who loved us and gave himself for us that we together 
might be made righteous in him. Amen.